Okay. We're good? Yeah, I'll sit back up there. How are you all doing this morning? Good. 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 All right, all right. So uh, last time I was in a rush, so let me uh, give you a little bit of recap of what I say last time. So right now we're gonna start a conversation by talking about different types of business research. First one we talked about last time, why business research. That means we conduct a research focusing on a particular organization or entity. So the answer of the research question would then apply to that organization or entity. So I gave you these two examples, right? So in other words, when we have the answer to the first question or to the second question, then we can feed back to McDonald's or MSU Texas, all right? Now the second type is called basic business research. So that means we're not really focusing on a particular entity or organization. Our objective is to identify knowledge that can expand what we already know, okay? So in other words, any organization that has relevant issues can learn from this particular research. So I'll give you two examples. And I mentioned to you, I think last time about cognitive dissonance, right? So do you feel regret that after you purchase something, either online or in person, you feel that, man, I shouldn't have bought it. You feel that way before? Yes, and why? Well, you, say, you may argue that I might not, I probably don't need this. It's a little bit too expensive, all those kind of things, right? But sometimes we experience cognitive dissonance before we purchase, before. So we haven't even bought any, but we already feel great about our intention to purchase. So when we see stuff on the, let's say, shelf, and it says $800, let's assume that you already have the money. But then you probably can go through some mental process, tell you, oh, do I really need this? All those kind of things. I don't really think I should, but I really want. Okay, so that's also cognitive dissonance in that sense, but it's pre-shopping. Okay, the second question is mm -hmm. more about, do you think the length in terms of uh, employees tenure measured by time? Now, how long an employee stays with the organization? Do you think that time can influence employees' productivity? Do you think it can? What would be your argument for yes, it can. So the longer you stay with the organization, then the better you perform. The more productive you are. What would be a logical argument for that? Because you know the routine, you know the requirements, you become more efficient, yes. What else? You can argue that because you have been trained multiple times, right? What about the opposite argument? That the longer you stay, maybe the less productive you are. You get bored? Good. Oh, uh, since we've been there for so long, you can kind of get comfortable and you feel like you can get fired. So you just do the bare minimum. Okay, so productivity doesn't matter to you anymore. Maybe initially you want to have job security so you perform at a higher level, right? So good. The answer to this question then can be either yes or no, depending on your argument. But after going through that scientific process, you only get one answer, am I right? But this basically tells you all the way back that last time we discussed. When you come out, after you come up with a research question, and you can only have one answer from a logical standpoint, then you probably don't need to do that research because you're probably gonna only find that answer, all right? But these two, you can either say yes or no at this point of time before you even go through statistical analysis. But after you have statistical analysis, you have the data, you may have only one answer. You will have one answer, but it doesn't mean that it will won't be other variables affecting this. 
relationships, all right? Let's just keep in mind. But after you figure out the answer, this, for instance, this question may be able to apply to Walmart employees or MS in Texas employees or IBM employees because it's all relevant to them, all right? So this is the nature of basic research, business research. Now let's look at this particular slide. I would like you to come up with one example for applied business research, which is specifically to an organization or entity. And uh, an example for basic business research. Can anybody answer this question? Jump start, okay? For applied business research, we talk about Chick fil A. How about that? Which I hate it so much. <laughs> then you're gonna say, no, it's not true. All right, let's talk about Chick fil A. What can, we, what can we do about Chick fil A? What kind of problem do you think we can solve for Chick fil A? Research that gets more popular in the South or North? Good. Now, can we say yes or no before we even do the research? Which means if we can only say one answer, then we don't need to do that research, okay? So ask yourself, is it more popular in the South than in the North? The answer is yes or no? Uh, probably. Probably, but it could be no, right? Okay, yes. Uh, what kind of construction ideas can Take the drive through, make it for less time for uh, cars to go through the drive through in the time order. Because I know the line's really long all the time. So, yeah. Okay, so you're talking about more of a descriptive type of research, which, which we'll talk about what kind of drive through construction that you have or, or facility that you have to make it faster, right? But do you realize that you're building the second one down in Southwest Parkway? Yeah, which is the one that I would never visit anyway. <laughs> All right, what about basic business research? A question, by the way, that's a good question. Uh, a basic business research, that means we're identifying a research question that can be applied to almost all organizations. Not all, but almost. And I'll give you a jump start that just focused on employees, whatever is related to employees. What can we do about employees? Could you say, like with this question, how can we better employee efficiency, say in the fast food industry? That's almost that's a good that's a good uh, response. But I have to emphasize that it's almost applied in nature as well as basic in nature because you mentioned about fast food which is okay but then there are many kind of fast food restaurants right so it has a basic research in nature as well but i i would like to hear from you in terms of concrete variables so what if, what about employees and what will be the outcomes of whatever you want to study what will be that question so let's focus on in the fast food industry, that's okay. One unique characteristic of fast food industry is what? In terms of employees' performance of their job. What would be that unique characteristic compared to non-fast food industry? 
when you walk into, again, I hate to use McDonald's, but they just picked on McDonald's, all right? You walk into McDonald's, what do you see after you order? Well, it's not what I wanted. Combo number one. If you look back to the kitchen, what do you think that you see? You see a group of people running around cooking, all right, obviously. But they're not doing the whole thing at once. Which what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, each person has a unique responsibility, right? So for instance, you look at the French fry station. They say they need more French fry now. They go to the freezer, pick up a bag of frozen French fries, put in the basket, drop it down to the fryer, press a button, and then the left. You know why? Because the machine already calculates the time. 45 seconds, and will be. And then that person come back, pick it up. And that process is called, in the business world, standardization. Everything is highly standardized. You don't deviate from the existing work process. And do you know why they don't want employees to deviate from that? Yeah. Why don't we want them to mess up? Efficiency, good. So if we, they can be so efficient, that means customers can get their food faster. And fast food restaurants can only get paid, they can only claim that, all right, I earned something right now, after they get the money from the customers, right? So if you can speed up that process, after they place an order and they give them the food, then that transaction is done, then you make more money. You're more efficient in terms of making money. So that's why fast food restaurants, they want to be highly standardized for that reason. Then there's a question though. What do you think about employees' motivation in that sense? If all I'm asking you to do is press that button, yeah, 45 seconds, and then you wait. Once it beeps, pick it up between that small whatever trade that is. How do you feel about your motivation to perform? Is it an interesting job, boring job, exciting job, the job that you always want to go first thing in the morning? Probably not, right? So a good question could be that how does standardization in jobs affect employees' morale? Now, the answer might not necessarily be Yes, standardized, standardization is going to reduce employees' morale. Not necessarily. Think about this. If you can perform a job way faster, way more efficient, wouldn't you feel happy about your productivity? Could be. So that becomes an ambiguous question that you can ask. So you don't always have one answer. You can have both before you have your data. Okay? All right. So now let's look at different natures. Since we know different types, then we can look at different natures of business research. There are three different natures. First, we typically look at the cause and effects, so we call causal research. Then we have simply about describing a particular phenomenon that is the descriptive. And the last one is the one that I enjoy the most because it gives you follow-up research questions. You cannot really something at that point of time after you finish the first research because there's just so many variables that you should pay attention to as well that's called exploratory so let's go to causal research this is the one that in, at least in the business world we do the most okay so basically what it involves is you look at an effect that you're interested in knowing so for instance, you care a lot about employee satisfaction. That is the effect. So then you may want to ask yourself, what would be the cause of employee satisfaction? Okay? Then you identify that cause. Then you examine the strength of that impact on the effect. Well, before you even go to data collection, a question that you have to ask yourself as a researcher is this. How do I know there's some kind of causality? Therefore, I can say that potential cause is something that I should really examine, okay? 
you cannot randomly pick one, you have to have some logical sense. So that is why we look at potentially what are some evidence of causality, okay? First of all is you look at the time sequence of an event. So something happened, therefore another thing happened. Then you can say the first event could be a cause of a second event. Just like you see that, okay, the company is saving some money immediately after pay cut. So you can say that pay cut is the cause of save, all right? Because there's a time sequence. Then you can also look at whether or not two events vary together. But you cannot tell that which one is affecting which one, all right? So let me give you this example. Job satisfaction, how happy, how satisfied you are with your job can influence your commitment to the organization, am I right? So if you're happy with your job, then you tend to uh, show your attachment to the organization, am I right? Or you can say the other way around, that you feel like you're very committed to your organization, therefore whatever you do for your organization will trigger that sense of satisfaction, right? So that means these two tend to go up together or go down together, but you don't know which one comes first. Therefore, you do the research, all right? All right, the last one is the one that will give you the strongest evidence of causality, which also means it gives you the less meaningfulness of conducting this research, okay? Let me give you this example. When you don't have any other possible alternative to ex explain, why a particular event occurs, but that particular cause, then there is high evidence of causality. So for instance, you look at a pot of boiling water. The pot of boiling uh, water is boiling. What could be the reason? What could be the reason? Temperature. The temperature, right? Can I argue that? Oh, because no, I can't. It's not lost. All those kinds of things. So, temperature is the only possible explanation, and I can't identify the next, the next, or the other alternative. So, therefore, there's always a relationship between temperature and boiling water. But when you cannot identify another possible explanation for boiling water, do you even need to examine whether or not temperature can really affect? Boiling water? No, you can't. You don't need to. It's already known by you. Am I right? But at least that still tells you all well, these two events, they have some relationship. All right? Okay. Then, after we obtain some evidence of causality, we need to look at the degree, how much causality that we can find. And the first one is just like the previous slide the absence of an alternative. Uh, explanation, all right, which give you the absolute causality. So if you look at the example, the behavioral outcome that I wanted to know is searching for food. All of a sudden, I see them, all of you are searching for food. So I wonder why you're searching for food. Why? Because you're bored? Do you need money? Do you want to have friends? Those are not possible explanations, right? The only possible explanation is because you're hungry. So that just gives you the highest level of causality. Yet, that means you probably don't need to do this research because it's already known. There's no way that could be another possible alter or alternative, but again, we're talking about from a logical sense, all right? Then you have conditional causality, that means the cause may be necessary, but not sufficient enough, okay? So for instance, you lower the product price, then you gain market share. Why do you think this is necessary, but not sufficient? 
to always, when I say sufficient, it means to always trigger the event. That means to have this event. This, lowering the product price may be necessary, but independently may not be sufficient. Why? Yes. Yeah, but they, I bet they wouldn't mind to, to spend less, even if they earn more. Everybody wants to spend less, right? Regardless of the income level. So why that wouldn't guarantee that you get more market share? Yes. But you can compensate that for having more market share. You lower, yes, you earn less. But then when you sell to more, you also get more. You might not have the advertisement of the quality of sale. The advertisement? For the quality of the sale. They don't know about the product. Oh. Okay, so you, you're saying that even after you lower the price, if consumers, they don't have the brand awareness, you might, miss, not, you might not be able to sell to them. Good answer. What else? Price is always associated with something else. Okay, what else? We're talking about the product. Price is attached to the product, right? There's also something else that we can guess by seeing the price of the product. What is Demand? it? Demand? No. Quality? Good, quality. When we go to Walmart, that's a general assumption. Maybe may be wrong. They always say what? Low prices. Here, low prices, you think about what? A cheap stuff. Most of the time, you say cheap stuff, low quality. Not necessarily the truth but that just common perception, right? So when you lower the price, then you're running into the risk of what? Being perceived as offering low quality product. And that might not be able to sell you more product, therefore you might not be able to gain more market share, okay? But it is important that customers see that they can afford a particular product, which is associated with lowering the product price, okay? All right. So then you have the last one, contributory. That means the cause is not necessary to trigger, to have, to be there to trigger the event, nor is it sufficient to trigger the event, but there's some relationship. For, for instance, you hire more employees and you gain more market share. How does that make any sense? But can you come up with a logical sense or explanation to say that yeah, you may be able to get more market share by hiring more employees. enough you you have more employees that they produce more but to, after producing more there's no guarantee that you'll be able to sell right so there is still a gap and you need to explain that gap for that to happen what would be a possible explanation that you produce more yeah you hire more people then you produce more but how do you explain that after you produce more then people buy more from you how do you explain something has to happen Usually, one of the benefits of working for a particular company is employee discount, right? So I got to hire these people to work for them. Work for us, you get discount for this, discount for that, right? So can we make a general assumption that, for instance, when Walmart hires more employees, they use that way to motivate employees to stick to them. 
by offering employee discount to say 20%. So not only now you can sell to existing customers, you can also sell to your employees. So then you get more market share. We only talking about market share, so we're not, not talking about profit. We only talk about how your product is dominating this particular market with competing products, that's it, okay? So that's a long stretch, but it's possible. But again, to have this happen because of this, the other things also need to happen, okay? So for instance, the price has to be right, the amount of discount has to be right to trigger this event from a logical standpoint, okay? But there is some levels of causality that we can look at, all right? Okay, so this is causal research. Then the next one is called the descriptive type of research. By descriptive, we're looking at the W question, the when, the why, the how, the what, okay? So for instance, these questions are related to descriptive type of research. So how should MSU Texas advertise? So the, the answer could be they advertise on social media, they advertise on TV, channel, all those kind of things, so the how. Then you have why students attend MSU Texas. You can say that because of academic reputation, you can say it's infrastructure, you can say it's academic, uh, uh, athletic reputation, all those kind of things. So that addresses why, all right? Then you can also ask yourself, what are the characteristics of Walmart customers? So you can look at the agenda, the age, the socioeconomic, status, all those kind of things. Then finally, you can also ask yourself, when do you think Tesla should offer gas powered vehicles? Maybe you can say 2021, 2025, or never, something like that. But again, you only address the edge questions. You're not really giving any explanation. So for instance, the second question, now we know that students come here because they want to have small class sizes, right? But why? It's not really something that you're trying to answer. Why they want small class sizes? You're not answering that. You only answer why did they come. After you identify that answer, you yes, you can follow up with that, but that's not the nature of the research right here, okay? Okay. The last one is what I like to do the most, exploratory type of research. That means you are examining a question that's highly, highly ambiguous. And even after you get an answer, you might not have a very, very strong conclusion to say that the answer is absolutely this. Therefore, future research is always needed, all right? So for instance, I believe that I mentioned to you last time about my experience of job boarding, right? That's something like that? Okay, so let me give you again a little bit of that story. A lot of time when I was in my office working on stuff, trying to be politically correct, stuff, I feel bored. Then when I feel bored, there's a discrepancy between the perceived level of effort that I put forth and the amount of reward that I receive from my job. So when I feel bored, I tend to feel like I'm not putting a lot of effort forward to justify for my reward, which is paycheck, for instance, okay? So that creates a perception of positive ineffort. That means I'm overpaid, all right? But what do you think I should do when I perceive positive inequity? That I feel that I'm overpaid. And the human nature is all of us are like this. When we have some kind of perception of inequity, whether or not it's underpay or overpay, we have some tension or discomfort. And we're motivated to correct that. Okay? So when I have perception of positive inequity, what do you think I could do? I feel like I'm overpaid. I'm not really doing something meaningful. 
job is so boring. Yet every day I'm seeing that deposit in my bank. Very good, very good, very good. No, not, not that much. But what? What do you think I could do? Tell them to cut your pay. Uh, or donate the money. I have to feed my family. And do more work. <laughs> do more work. Good. Do more work is the end. So think about this. Effort, reward. And you know me. I have my self-interest. No way I'm going to drop this to match this. It's going to stay there for sure. <laughs> oh, I'm going to hide increases. Am I right? Okay. But the problem is, I already feel bored in terms of performing my job. How am I supposed to increase my effort in this case? By doing what? The struggle, the dilemma right here is I can't do much for my own job, which is why I am experiencing boredom. Am I right? Get a new job. Get a, like change my job? Yeah. But then this will be the this side that we will be different as well. So maybe in your new job you can be doing stuff that you don't like to work. Uh, okay, that's one possibility. Let's just say that I have strong commitment to MSU Test. <laughs> Two different things within your job sphere, on the entrance sphere, but instead of just bringing like talking on a computer, go around and communicate with others with different ideas that might interest you. Okay, good. So the key point right here is what? When I can do much about my own job, yet I still want to put more effort forth to match that, then I would probably do something like this, pro-social behavior, such as I would knock on my colleague's doors. If you need a helping hand, any issues that I can help you with. So if they say yes, then all of a sudden there's some kind of effort I need to put forth, right? So that brings up the effort level to match the reward. You may think this is very naive. Nobody will ever do something like that. You are right. That's why we want to do this research. I only observe myself. I don't know whether or not this is what other people would do. So I came up with this research, and I'm actually doing it right now. And I also understand there are so many variables that can influence this relationship. For instance, how sensitive you are in terms of equity. So for instance, you may be an entitled person that you always deserve to get more pay than anyone else. Then you wouldn't have this behavior, am I right? But you, you are more of a benevolent type of individual that you may care a lot about how much effort you put forth, am I right? So I also include that in my research. So then I gather data and then you know what I found out? Benevolent individuals, when they experience job boredom, they did report a high level of positive inequity, which is what I described to you. They feel that they put little effort forth, yet they get too much reward. Okay? Benevolent people, they feel that way. But I did not have any evidence to say that after they perceive positive inequity, they go above and beyond. And actually they don't. Nuh -uh. They say, I'm not doing it. So then that naturally triggered the next question. So what did they do to balance that out, right? And that's for future research, which I don't know right now. But I can clearly see the evidence that when they experience job boredom, they perceive positive inequity. They feel that they overpay. But how they correct that? I don't have any evidence. The interesting thing is this though. Entitled people, when they experience job boredom, they don't have positive inequity perception. Instead, they have negative inequity perception, which means they still feel they're underpaid. Huh. What could be a possible explanation for that? We're not paying them less. They get the same pay. 
But why, how come all of a sudden when they experience job boredom, they perceive negative inadequate, which means the effort is way out there, but the reward is way down there. Why? How is that possible? Again, my research doesn't give that scientific evidence, that explanation, but my logical explanation is this. Because they, they, it's because of their entitlement, they could blame the organization for not giving them a rewarding, exciting, and stimulating work environment. Okay? So that drops the level of reward down there. So, what do you think they do to correct that negative inequity? What do you think they do to bring that up? Or what do you think they do to bring that effort down? They actually engage in deviant behavior. So for instance, they go look at YouTube videos, they try to go out and uh, gossip with other people, all those kind of behaviors. Non-counterproductive behavior. Okay, so you see the interesting part right there that the same cause, which is boredom at work, can lead to two different kinds of behaviors depending on individuals, or perception, I should say. But then I don't have further conclusion in terms of what about the benevolent individuals, what would they do after they experience boredom? That's for future research, okay? So in other words, this research question is exploratory in nature. It triggers follow-up research. The same thing for the second research question, which I also did it about 10 years ago. You all shop online before, right? Where'd you go shop? Amazon? All right. I recently shopped, not recently, but a couple months ago, I shopped. I bought an iPhone case from Amazon. Okay, so let's just use that example. I'm not a good drawer. I can draw pretty well, so this is an iPhone case. Ten dollars, is that reasonable? Okay. By the way, this is for camera and then the whole. Also ten dollars. Seller A, seller B. Identical product. Let's just assume that. Identical price. What else do you pay attention? Before you decide, I'm gonna try to buy from A, I'm gonna buy from B. What else do you pay attention? Reviews. Yeah, reviews. All right. Let's say this person has 2,500 reviews. 86% positive. That means 14% negative. Okay? Is seller. Three, five. That's it. No negative. No negative. Where do you want to buy from? Okay. Who said that? Do you want to be one of these? But there's a far higher chance. Uh, because not a lot of people bought from me. More people bought me. So whoever bought from me, they feel good. Yeah, but it's, it's a too small of a, of a size to charge. You could be the first bad person. The first person being one. Good idea, but you can continuously be the bad right there. Uh, does it count? It doesn't, it doesn't count anymore? We're talking about percent. We're not talking about numbers. This percentage is the percent number, but it's 14% out of 2,500. If not a lot of people bought this one, then that tells you something. People don't like it or something. Somebody has to start from the beginning. We don't penalize them for starting from the beginning. Okay, I respect your end. A, what about the rest? Also A, you be A. Nobody wants to buy from B? Come on, that's very discouraging. What if you want to become an Amazon seller? How are you gonna start if people believe like this? All B, you say you want B? What's your, what's your argument? Oh, that, that's positive. I'm hoping that I have a positive view as well. Okay, so this, because zero percent to the negative, that gives you more hope. All right. 
that you put here in my research finding, I'll give you the next example that I set up in my experiment, okay? So now let's not look at iPhone, okay? Let's look at, look at actual iPhone. So let's say that it's a thousand dollars now. Is that reasonable? Okay. Still the same. What do you want to buy from? Which one? They're different iPhones? Same iPhone. Identical iPhone, identical price. Same thing, right? The only difference is that that's a possibility. So you're telling me that you are losing possibly a thousand dollars. Not just ten dollars, but a thousand. Which one I want to buy from? I buy from you, I don't care. In this case, you don't care. Yeah, because because like with phones, like you like it's it comes from the same company, Apple. Right, like you can you can say that all right, the, the shipping process is bad, or the product is you know something like that is related to the seller rather than the product. Because this is from this is not related to Apple. This is related to the seller. But Amazon won't have two pages for the same product. Jump. You just like click buy and then Amazon just like yeah. doesn't jump. Even though you can still get compensated for bad experience, but again, most of us don't want to have that same thing again, right? But again, question is which one do you think you want to buy? You say any of these is fine. But well, how come when it's ten dollars you stick to it? Because because with a case it can it can the case was the same thing or is it different? You said the same, same thing, same thing. Same case. Oh, if it, oh, if it was the same thing, I'd buy from either. Oh, so you okay. All right. I thought there were different cases. They're all the same product type, same. Only difference is the online review configurations. A or B? Mostly A? You A? Okay. And I did actually, you're all right in terms of human behavior, shopping behavior. The evidence that I got is uh, is uh, do you know in this, in this case, what is the implication? that I can send to sellers, online sellers. If you all want to buy from A, what do you think those online sellers can learn from my reason? Put percentages instead of numbers? No, I think you're talking about numbers. Because you want to buy from A. Most people, I'm not saying you, most people want to buy from A. And the reason for that is because this person has more reviews then you as an online seller, you want to sell this first. Then you focus on this. Not that I'm saying positive is not important. You don't want to have all 2,500 or negative. But what I'm saying is, if you see that there is a clearly clear trend that you're getting more positive, then you want to sell this right now. Because that is associated with brand awareness. When you have more reviews, people know more about you as a seller. Okay, now, why do you think that this will be exploratory in nature, which means future research is still needed to clarify a lot of things? What could be something that future research could do without really changing the direction of research? And this is real research, so I focus on the iPhone case and the actual iPhone. So we're talking about, first of all, phone. What about other products? Do we think that other products can affect people's decision to purchase? Possibly, right? I don't have all the time to manipulate the configuration of reviews. So I arbitrarily set up this. 2500, 86, 14, and 3. But what if it's 80%? You gonna struggle a little bit now? What if I drop to 75%? You gonna struggle a little bit now, right? So what is that optimal number? We don't know. But I can only tell based upon my existing finding if there's a huge difference in terms of the number of online reviews, then that could change people's decision to shop. So focus on that. That is what I can conclude right now, all right? So that's why I split right here as future research is needed 
to understand more about this relationship. Okay? All right. So let me uh, wrap up this by telling you that the whole focus of business research is built upon the scientific method, which means we want to make sure that starting from the very beginning, we come up with a logical research question that the answer could be yes or no, not just one way. Then we follow the scientific process of gathering data and then uh, enter the statistical analysis process and then draw the conclusion from there. That is the scientific process, okay? So this is the graphical display of a scientific process and I'll give you an example of this. So first of all, you use your prior knowledge and personal observation looking at a particular event or phenomenon and then you want to identify, for instance, the cause of that particular event. So then you hypothesize based upon your logic. And then after you have your own hypotheses, then you conduct a hypothesis test using real world data. It could be human beings, it could be animals, it could be organizations, it could be anything, all right? Then you draw the conclusion based upon your empirical finding, okay? So let me give you this example. I, as a manager, always hope that my employees, my subordinates, can always express to me their opinions, their suggestions. But that could include our decision-making process or organizational performance. But a lot of times, employees do not wish to express their disagreements, their opinions, their suggestions. You know why? They don't want to get fired. Yes, it's very risky. It's a behavior that it's about changing the status quo, right? And human nature is we're very comfortable in our current environment, therefore we don't want no change. But when your employees are making constructive criticism, then that bothers a lot of people, okay? That's why people don't really want to do that as employees. But I still want as a manager, it's assumed, okay? This is healthy. So that's the event that I want to know, what causes people to express, okay? Which is right here, the voice behavior, all right? So then I observe, based upon my prior observation or knowledge, I see that, hey, I tend to have a better relationship, a personal relationship with those that I pay the most, okay? So, so, so when they have a better relationship with me, they don't mind to tell me how they think about different things, okay? So that's my observation. So when they, I pay them well, they trust me, that I treat them fairly, when they have trust in me, they don't mind to share with me how they feel. That's the observation. So I come up with this particular hypothesis. I say that when an employee is satisfied with the pay, okay, they tend to show more boys behavior, which means they tend to express more. That's my own theory, okay? So at this point, Step number two, we're talking about right there. Whether or not it's true, we don't know, but it is from a theoretical standpoint. That's what I believe is true. But then we are going to use scientific evidence to prove that, empirical evidence to prove this. So therefore I collect the data, I can go observe, I can go survey, I can go interview them, okay? Then I draw the conclusion, the answer is yes, okay. What can I tell the manager, which is myself? Maybe if I really want to have more voice from my employees, I probably need to increase the pay, even though it might not be realistic, but that's the evidence. So you communicate that back to your manager in terms of the research finding. That means our findings, after we conduct a particular type of business research, can be applied to all these areas can be the kind of product that we want to offer to the market. It can be how we can produce a product or services 
more efficiently and more effectively. We can also ask ourselves how we should advertise the kind of commercials that we want to put out. Or finally, we can talk about what managers should do to enhance, for instance, employees' motivation and satisfaction. So business research can apply to all areas of business. All right? The most important part is actually the later part. That is, once you have the conclusion, you feed back to the relevant organization or individuals. They are going to take your recommendation and do something about it, right? So when you, for instance, recommend that, all right, increase their pay. That's a naive recommendation. Say so increase their pay. If you want to have more voice on your employees, you bring that back to your manager. Let's just say that your manager said, all right, let's try that. So trying that is actually the very first step. You identify the opportunity of increasing people's pay. Who should I increase? How much should I increase? All those kind of things. But the fourth bullet point is what I think is the most important one. After you implement that particular recommendation coming from the research, you also need to evaluate how effective that recommendation is. And how you, effect, how you evaluate can based upon how much you really follow through in terms of that recommendation. So for instance, you can look at on a five year basis, how many people that you increase the pay, all right? Or you can look at the actual outcome, how much voice that your employees are expressed after you increase the pay. Okay, so two different aspects that you can focus on. But essentially, I'm trying to present to you that your research, after you conduct research, and you find the findings, you don't just step, uh, stop there. You feed back to your, your managers and you let them exercise what you recommend them to do, all right? So uh, the conclusion right here is, when you conduct research, make sure you have good problem statements, good definition, avoid tautology. By tautology, I mean, don't define some two things in a similar way. So job satisfaction commitment. You don't want to define satisfaction as how committed you are to your job. And that's almost the same as commit itself, okay? And finally, control the research context so that you don't have other noise in the research context, all right? Okay, it's good to present this in front of all of you. Uh, if you have any interest in doing research in the business field, contact me. If I cannot help you with, then I will refer you to other faculty members. All right, and uh, that's it. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I just think that next person, like you said, if it's if it's a, if it's a small company hasn't yet right. developed it, if you have one bad review here, minor effect, statistically, right? Right. But one bad review, the next, the, you know, the next review to come in, it just came in negative. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be pretty, pretty right. serious. So this one's buffered a little bit more than this one. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. It's just an interesting. I I yeah. I just I guess I think about that <laughs> as a biologist. <laughs> so hey there, what's up? Oh. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to uh, upload the um, presentation, and then we'll also do it on Zoom. But you're probably going to be actually driving or something, so you're not going to be able to watch it. All right, thank you. All right, sure. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Hi, I didn't ask okay, we were doing Friday because we have a I had a family emergency, so uh -huh. Friday, I can Zoom into the class.